You're considering setting up your first saltwater aquarium, but maybe you need some specific details as well as some inspiration. Let's take a tour of my Hello Reef tank, which has been up and running for about four months now. The tank is a 15 gallon all in one style system with high clarity, low iron glass, three compartment rear filter, and a pre attached foam mat base. The 15 gallons is divided between the large display portion and the smaller rear filtration chamber. The overall tank dimensions are 15 inches wide by 15 inches long by 15 inches tall, so it's a 15 inch cube. We can further break this up into two compartments with the primary display chamber running 15 inches long by 11 inches wide and the rear filtration chamber running 15 inches long by three and a half inches wide. The rear filter has three total chambers. Chamber one measures three and a half inches by three inches. Chamber two measures six and a half by three and a half inches. And the third chamber measures three and a half by four inches. Overall, when fully loaded with sand, rock, and seawater, it will weigh approximately 165 pounds. While it may seem a bit dull talking about tank measurements, at some point you're probably going to want to add some upgraded gear to make your maintenance life faster and easier, and those tank specs will come in super handy. I'm using all the gear that came with the Hello Reef kit and I've added a few upgrades, which I'll show you in a minute. In the display portion of the tank, you'll find a 10 pound bag of Carib Seas Aragolive Sand, Coraline Color Human Made Carib Sea Life Rock, a Ciche Wave Maker, a BRS Thermometer, and an Aqua Illumination 12 inch blade grow light. In the rear chamber, we've got the filter sock, sponge, pack of carbon, baggie of ceramic biomedia, Eheim Jaeger heater, and a CJ return pump. That's all the included gear, but I've added a few extras for added redundancy, consistency, and just to make my life a bit easier. First, I added a temperature controller. Basically, this little gadget has a temperature probe and a power outlet. I put the probe in the display portion of the tank and set the controller to keep my tank water between 77 and 78 degrees Fahrenheit all the time. Not only will this temperature controller keep my water temp really, really consistent, but it also has a high and low alarm function that will emit a loud beep and let me know if there's something wrong. You might be wondering, isn't the heater supposed to keep the temperature within a small range and you are correct while it does a good job a temperature controller does it better and unfortunately when we're talking about heaters they are mechanical pieces of equipment and all mechanical things will eventually break whether that's five ten years down the line so it's a really nice idea to have a temperature controller as a backup that will emit some loud noises to let you know when there's a problem I've used several inexpensive controllers over the the years but this one from Inkbird works well and comes with salt water and corrosion proof probes perfect for the salt water environment the next piece of gear I've added is actually a second heater. Now you might be wondering, why would you add a second heater since you already added the Inkbird temperature controller? Well, the reality is I'm not always at home and if I'm away for the day or gone for a weekend and my controller alarm starts going off, I'm just not gonna be around to hear it. So the beauty of a second heater is that I can set it to go on at 75 degrees. That way if the primary heater breaks or something goes wrong while I'm away, the temperature will fall to 75 and then that second heater will kick in, thus basically saving the entire tank. The third piece of gear I added was an auto top off unit, also commonly called an ATO for short. My family went away for the weekend and I wasn't going to be home to add that evaporated water back into the tank, so the auto top off unit is a device that did it automatically for me. I'm currently using the Tunza Osmolator Nano Unit, but the Reef Breeder Prism ATO or the Ice Cap Gravity ATO would also work just fine. I keep a five gallon bucket of filtered water in the cabinet under my tank as the reservoir, and now I don't have to manually top off the tank anymore. Moving on to something a bit more exciting are animals. I've stocked this tank with two Ocellaris clownfish, two peppermint shrimp, one skunk cleaner shrimp, a tuxedo sea urchin, five astrea snails, five serith snails, five hermit crabs, 
and 10 rose-colored captive raised bubble tip anemones from Worldwide Coral. I'm still waiting for my anemones to host my clownfish, but last week I did see the smaller of my clownfish touch its tail to one of the anemones several times, so I am hopeful that pretty soon they will take to each other. I've been using the old tape of clownfish in an anemone picture to the side of your tank trick off and on for a few months, but still no luck. But I'm not concerned. I've had the experience before where I had a couple captive bred clownfish that wouldn't go anywhere near the anemones for like a year. But then one day I woke up, I came out and I looked at the tank and there they were. So I am hopeful that it will eventually happen. I've had to make small adjustments to my feeding schedule because my nitrate and phosphate levels were creeping up too high, even with doing a consistent weekly 10% water change. So now in the mornings, I feed approximately 20 BRS pellets as well as three to four cobalt aquatic shrimp pellets for my three shrimp and hermit crabs. In the afternoon, I feed a half a cube tops of Hikari frozen mysa shrimp. To really dial things in, I've been testing my water three times a week. I've been testing for nitrate, phosphate, alkalinity, and pH, and I'm really glad I've been doing this because I've noticed a few things that were completely unexpected. First, regarding nitrate and phosphate, I was testing that three times a week, and the numbers just kept creeping higher and higher. So the first step I took was to change my feeding. I was feeding pellet food in the morning and the afternoon, so I went ahead and switched that afternoon pellet feeding to a frozen food feeding using Hikari mysis. While that certainly did help, those numbers were still going up. Not quite as fast, but they were still increasing. I have a pretty wide tolerance when it comes to nitrate and phosphate levels, but when my nitrate level starts getting up to 15, 20 parts per million and my phosphate levels are getting 0.2 parts per million, I start getting a little worried and want to take action. I know my fish and inverts are going to be totally fine with those raised levels of nitrates and phosphates, but if I'm being totally honest with you, I've struggled with anemone health in the past, and I know anemones don't like quick swings of nitrates and phosphates as well as elevated levels of those. So I needed to not only stabilize those numbers, but also bring them down slowly. So there are two things I did to bring it under control. The first thing I did was I started being more consistent with changing out my filter system socks, making sure I did it every two to three days. But in order to make that easier, I did go and pick up some extra filter socks, which are available both at Hello Reef website and the Bulk Reef Supply website. The second thing I did is to drastically increase how much water I was changing out during my weekly water change. I went from one gallon a week to five gallon a week. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, but I always keep a batch of preheated and pre-made salt water, so it really wasn't that difficult. On top of the reduced feeding, the change of food, the changing of the filter socks more frequently, and larger water changes, I also started a weekly sand bed clean. This was super easy to implement using my two inch Python gravel vacuum, and it had the added side benefit of removing some of those ugly diatoms that like to grow on my sand bed. Another surprising find was my alkalinity was actually going down each week, even with the larger five gallon water change. Now, I I think that was probably because my animals were happy, especially my sea urchin, my shrimp, my hermit crabs, and my snail, since all of them use alkalinity to secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton or shell for that matter. But I also noticed the growth of something called coralline algae. It's this really unique algae that secretes a calcium carbonate shell, which means it's also using up that alkalinity from the tank. While I'm sure those five gallon water changes would have been enough to keep the alkalinity in a safe range, I use a little bit of my intermediate reefing knowledge to help increase the alkalinity by using Kalkwasser. Besides Kalkwasser, there are two other things I'm dosing to my tank every week, and the first is Brightwell Aquatics Coral Aminos. A friend of mine who's an anemone expert does this, so I've adopted it too. Amino acids form the base of building blocks for protein, so it should help our 
anemones grow. The second thing I'm adding every week is Microbacter 7 from Brightwell Aquatics. I do this after my weekly water change because during that water change, since I'm gravel vacuuming the sand bed, I'm disturbing a lot of the surface area that those beneficial bacteria live on. And since Microbacter 7 is a kind of beneficial bacteria, I figure it just can't hurt to add it in. I've been doing this in all my tanks for years and I don't know if it works or not, but I have some friends who do it as well, so I figure why not. With all the testing I've done and all the changes I've made because of it, including the five gallon weekly water change, I've really avoided any other problems in the tank. The only issue I can think of is the diatoms are still growing in a small amount on the sand bed, but honestly, that's just good food for my snail, so I have no problem with that at all. I've also started to notice a large copepod population growing, and they absolutely love diatoms, so all in all, I think it's a good thing. As long as diatoms are growing, but I'm not getting other nuisance algaes like green hair algae or bryopsis, I am a happy hobbyist. I'm curious to know now, how is your Hello Reef tank doing? Have you added any extra gear or maybe experienced some problems? leave a comment down below. I would love to see how you're doing. But until next video, be well and happy reefing everybody.